John Kettle Interchange has been evolving since it, uh, basically since it was first opened. Like it opened first off as a, an ordinary roundabout between the N8 and the N25 when the Glanmar Bypass and the Carrick Bypass were opened. Then it changed once the tunnel opened the, with the addition of the two flyovers taking traffic from east to west. And subsequent to that then, because of traffic demand and traffic congestion at the interchange, traffic lights were added and various tweaks were made to it. By about 2007, when I first came involved in the project, it became apparent that we had developed the interchange in its current form as much as we possibly could, and it was still under traffic pressure. So between 2007 and 2009, we undertook a number of feasibility studies and traffic modelling exercises to look at what could be done to the interchange to improve the traffic throughput. And ultimately, the decision was taken in 2009 that the only solution was to do a full, thorough upgrade of the interchange which would involve major civil engineering works and new link roads and try and take out the traffic lights, take out the stop lines and facilitate the traffic in flowing through the interchange as freely as possible. It took quite a while to develop a design for the interchange. As you can imagine, it is a complex area. Not only is there 120 odd thousand vehicles using the interchange on a daily basis, but you have the Jack Lynch Tunnel very close by, you have the Loch Mahan close by, you have a number of environmentally sensitive sites, you have a number of industrial facilities, and you've got the railway. So it's a, quite a constrained site. Like I often say, if you're going to build an interchange, I wouldn't start here. But we, we had what we had when we had to deal with it. So it took quite a, a bit of work. In fact, it took about two and a half years of design work in order to get the design to a point where we were able to go to planning and TI was supported by Jacobs Engineering in that regard as our technical advisors. And they put in sterling work looking at what could be fitted in, what could be achieved within the space available to us, and with what made sense from a cost-benefit perspective as well. CISC would have tendered the project back in for the advance works back in 2018 and started work on advance works later on in 2018 which included utility works diversion of major utilities to clear the path for the work some environmental mitigation there's egrets out on the uh, in some trees and there was fencing to put up for environmental mitigation so we were here and then doing some site accesses and, and ancillary road works that again all made the delivery of the main project more straightforward. The big considerations I suppose and the big challenges on this project have been the traffic obviously so there was always a, a push to progressively take movements of traffic out of the roundabout so by opening structure 9 which is one of the railway bridges it took the eastbound movement out of the roundabout and, and we progressively worked through the movements by building the dumbbell interchange up by, by Viatras Again, it took movements out of the absolute intensity of traffic in, in the Dunkettle interchange because obviously the original roundabout is now gone. So the, the, the planning of the works was to try and whittle away at the traffic and get them into their permanent position at the minimum amount of, of disruption to them. And I suppose, I mean, the, the, the other two big considerations from a, a construction point of view would be the ground conditions on the site are particularly bad. There's a lot of soft alluvium. It's a lot of reclaimed land and you can see that from the ponds that still exist around the site. It's all a tidal system so there's there's a tide here every day. You've got the, the full tide of the ponds fill and, and, and lower. The ground is very bad so there was a, a big geotechnical solution developed with our designers again. And then I suppose the other the other consideration on the project would have been the, the interface with Irnor there and there's three railway bridges were delivered as part of the scheme and a railway bridge demolished. So there was a phased construction and demolition. Really, I don't think we, I think it would be fair to say the relationship with Erin with Erin was maintained throughout and an and absolute minimum disruption to any of their to any of their operations. I think given the complexity of this project and given the risks associated with it, I mentioned the tunnel, um, you know, the risk of doing something to the tunnel and having the tunnel closed as a result. You know, that's a risk we couldn't contemplate happening so we needed to build that out. Likewise some of our industrial neighbours we couldn't do anything that would shut them down or, or cause them to cease production. So the key thing we wanted from the contractor was obviously competence, the ability to to deliver projects of this ilk and deliver them well but also the ability to collaborate. Collaborate with us as the client, collaborate with our representatives, collaborate with all the stakeholders around because it wasn't something we could build in isolation here. 
we had to collaborate with our neighbours. And the contractor that was, that was going to deliver it on our behalf had to have that skill to be able to work with, with all of us because it wasn't just uh, a them and us situation where, where they could go out in a green field and build away and, and we'd check occasionally and make sure they were building what we asked them to. This was much more a team-based approach and that was, that was crucial. Obviously the other things, we needed a contractor who had an excellent safety record because one of our key, key criteria was we wanted everybody to come home safely at the end of every working day. And that, that was a sort of a, 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 an absolute from our point of view. The challenges really would have come from the, exactly the, the, the piecemeal delivery and the, the lack of connectivity between sites so that we were really building on a crossroads and we were in all four quadrants doing different things at different times, obviously with live traffic running um, through us all the time. Now that impacts everything you're doing from a, a flow of work, from a mobilisation. If you wanted to move a machine from one location to another, it has to go on a transporter and be moved. You can't just move, move around the site with, with ease. We were just mobilising to site when COVID happened and the lockdown happened. Because it was a critical infrastructure project, we were allowed to keep working through COVID, but I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of um, provisions made in the offices. People were encouraged to work from home if they could. Obviously on a building site, you need the workers on site. And maybe that was one of the benefits of being a bit segregated across the site because we, we did work in pods, but that would have probably been one of the biggest challenges that we wouldn't have been used to dealing with that we had to learn on our, on our feet as to how to deal with it and, and keep the job moving. Obviously traffic reduced in that period, so there was, there was pros and cons from the site's point of view. From our point of view, um, we were very aware from the get-go that this had the potential to impact on people and on people's journeys and on people's time. Um, and we wanted to make very, very sure that people were very aware of what was going on and had access to the facts that, you know, as you know, in the absence of information, rumours develop. We didn't want that. We wanted to get the information out there. People could accept it or not, but at least we would, they would have information from us. So uh, two main ways of doing that. One, we developed um, and we've maintained the project website, which is up to date, keeps people informed as to what is happening. And in parallel with that, there is a facility for people to sign up to a weekly newsletter. So, and that goes out by email at 12 o'clock on a Friday. And that gave people the up to date information, what's happened, what's planned to be happened, are there disruptions, road closures, any of that sort of information so that people can, can, can plan ahead. But in parallel with that and, uh, and, and sort of something that was novel for us, we developed a bespoke um, smartphone app which is available and provides information on traffic conditions at Dunkettle Interchange, both journey times and also access to, to the CCTV cameras so, so people can actually look and see what, how bad is the traffic, do I need to plan my journey differently, from our point of view, it was all about keeping people informed. The last thing we wanted was people to arrive at the end of the queue and think, what's happening? I don't know what's happening. And that causes frustration, that causes anger, and that, which is unnecessary because if, if we can get the message out quite easily and if people are aware of what's happening, then okay, it won't reduce the queue, but at least they know what's happening and that level of frustration is, is somewhat reduced. We had a, a, a traffic forum set up and in fairness to TII and Jacobs, who were the client's representative on the site, they had a, a very good dialogue going with a, a number of the major stakeholders, including the guards, the county councils, the, the local cyclist organisations, you know, all the affected people. So we were very much invited into that, but it was definitely made easier by the fact that it was a going, a going forum and they were receptive. I suppose people realised there was going to be a certain amount of disruption. CISC fed into what was already a good, a good communication structure that existed. Prior to the upgrade that, that's currently underway, the Dunkettle interchange was quite a hostile environment for cyclists. Like you could cycle through it to go if you wanted to go from Cork City out towards, towards Carrigtool, but you'd be taking your life in your hands. Like as part of the project, we have now provided a safe east-west connectivity for cyclists remote for the most part from traffic so cyclists can safely traverse the interchange from east to west and can also access into Little Island um, safely. So that opens up commuting opportunities for people on bike 
to get from the city or to get from Glenmire into Little Island and, and, and vice versa. I think probably the key environmental benefit of the scheme is the fact that we have reduced congestion. Unfortunately, we haven't managed to totally eliminate it given the nature of the traffic flows in the area. We've managed to achieve significant reductions in, in the congestion that was at the interchange previously. So the days of queuing back sort of two kilometres on the M8 southbound in the morning or queuing back to the Kinsale Road interchange on the N40 in the evenings, those seem to be gone, which is great. It um, shows that the interchange is, is doing what we, what we intended it to do. And obviously not having traffic sitting in congested conditions means they're not generating quite as much carbon, that they're moving through, their journeys are shorter, and that congestion is, is cutting down on not only carbon, but also the other pollutants that, uh, that, that motor vehicles produce. We're very, very proud of what we've delivered here. It must be said, it was a, a job that we had been keeping an eye on for a lot of years. It was a long time being discussed. The biggest thing was the team we put on the job, and, and they worked incredibly well with, with the, the, the TII team and the Jacobs team on site and I think together managed to overcome the challenge, really make the challenges work. We are very proud of the fact that we have delivered an upgraded interchange with the minimum of traffic disruption to the people of Cork. We're very proud that the interchange is doing what we intended it to do and has reduced significantly the congestion. But at a more local level, we are very proud of the way the team who delivered the project have all come together, have worked in a collaborative way, and all had the same goal. Get the job done the best way possible, minimise the impact on our neighbours and the travelling public, and bring everybody home safely. And we've achieved that, I think. And, and I think that, for, for me, that was what I set out at the start of the project, those three goals. And I think we've broadly achieved them, and I'm, I'm, I'm delighted with that. It's quite novel now to listen to the traffic news in the morning and Dunkettle doesn't get mentioned. By its absence, you know something has changed because I think the only way people knew of Dunkettle Interchange was they heard it every morning on the traffic news. It's not there anymore. Mm -hmm.